how can you do all that needs done in life and still pursue your desire to learn French or the guitar or grow a plant or make art? You can't put a fiddle under your pillow and wake up playing it, though how cool would that be? But one thing we can do, no matter how chaotic and overwhelming life can be, is know that every tiny small motion in the direction of those endeavors really do matter. And not only that, they add up over time with great momentum. Join me, Annie Fane Barillon, as I interview painters and gardeners, designers and musicians, photographers and cooks, creative livers of any kind, who have somehow, in the middle of it all, continued on their creative paths, no matter what. This is Fane House Radio, and I'm so glad you're here. Uh, well, I'm Tom Lydon, and I live in Northern California, and uh, I spent several years on a really rural piece of property, found that to be my main love and interest in, in creative action, actually, which is developing a homestead from nothing. And um, then from there, I, I uh, had to figure out how to make a living, and so I started a photography studio in the town of Ukiah, California, and specialized in mainly commercial product photography, a lot of wine bottles, things like that, or whatever whatever industry really needed in the area, um, because that's kind of my background. You also are my uncle, and so mm -hmm. that's a really fun thing, and um, it's meant a lot to me to be surrounded by, you know, creatives in my life and has had a huge impact. Um, I remember visiting your place in California and that you had artichokes in your garden. I couldn't believe it. And also like a nice awareness of how you set up space and like really warm wood and the bedroom window was like lower and large. So from the bed, you could just see the view when you woke up and all those things really rubbed off on me. Where do you think that general aesthetic came from for you or the desire to live off the grid for so many years? Yeah, well, I guess the aesthetic, I probably grew up with it in a way. I. And uh, growing up in New England, I really liked, you know, kind of old, warm things, you know, as opposed to modern style and technique and, and aesthetic. Um, and I went to college in a, upstate New York in a small little community in upstate New York, Alfred University, um, which is known for a ceramics uh, department. Um, and I was an art major and I got a BFA. But anyways, that environment uh, also really stimulated me because a lot of folks were, you know, building their own homes up in the woods and stuff like that. And and both the faculty and some students and graduate students were doing that. So that was kind of an influence too for that kind of lifestyle. And it kind of went from there. And I've always liked building things and, and it was an opportunity to build my own house. And, and so, uh, that's how it happened. And, the, and, the, and the, kind of the aesthetic also developed through the area here because it's Redwood country. The property that I purchased along with a couple other land partners um, had been logged at one point. So there was a lot of actually down timber that was still millable. And so we'd have stuff milled up with a, a, somebody would bring a little portable saw mill and mill up stuff. So the, the house kind of took on the quality of, you know, roughness and uh, rusticness. Yeah, homemade. Yeah. <laughs> when you before you went to college and everything, I mean, and as a kid, did you did you just like art, plain and simple? Uh, yeah, I remember as a kid, I was I was really into things like antiques. As a young kid, I loved going to auctions, and um, I was into old things in history, uh, American history, and it kind of. Uh, led into an art interest in high school. My art teacher really encouraged me to go on with it. Uh, and she was a really big influence early on in my life. And it seemed like that's what I kind of did best in, in, from an educational point of view. Uh, so I followed through and applied to art schools and, and then ended up in a, an art school, a small university, as I said, in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so your dad was first generation um, Swedish mm -hmm. in, in the new world and mm -hmm. worked his way up the ladder and everything. So what did what did they think about all that? 
Well, uh, it was interesting. First of all, my, my dad was really creative in his own realm. He, he loved building things. He was really into wood. His dad was really into the wood and had a, a little wood shop down in his basement. And so my dad did too. So I kind of, uh, oh, and he also built me a little workbench and stuff. And so I started really getting into wood and working with, with wood and, and, um, so what was your question? <laughs> well, um, no, I love hearing about this. Yeah. Just, you know, it's one thing for parents of that generation and time to support general creativity oh. versus, you know, wanting to go to college right. for it and actually make a career out of it, which you did successfully right. did, you know, right. he didn't then, know that at the time. Right. Yeah. And that's a good point. You know, I, I think, uh, uh, when I went to art school, I think my folks were happy that I was able to get into a college. And, and, and so, <laughs> so that was that was part of it. And so they followed me through with the art, you know, and they always kind of encouraged me to, to get involved with the commercial end of art, you right. know, to make a living. But they kind of accepted uh, what I was doing. I think by the time I graduated, I was kind of really kind of just way out there. And at that point, they didn't understand what I was doing at all. But they kind of let it happen. And then when I moved, I was in New York for a period of time and then uh, moved to a total opposite situation, living up on the, in, in the woods. And uh, they, I think my dad kind of liked the idea that I was building my own house because he could relate to that. So there yeah. was that part of it. And then when I started to actually develop a business around photography, he could relate to that because he was a businessman. So in some ways, but it took a while for them to come around. And, uh, but by the time I was probably 50 years old and established, they thought it was okay. Yeah, it was a proof of concept. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Do you think it helped having um, a fellow brother, also known as my father, mm -hmm. um, who loved natural building and studying and music and all those things too? Do you think that even if your parents didn't understand, they're like, well, okay, they're in this together or, <laughs> or something. Yeah, I think in a, in a way, they, that's, that's very true. Uh, David kind of led the, led the uh, direction um, with his music. And I think I kind of, in some ways, influenced him a little bit early on too about wanting to live in the country. He followed, you know, he followed me do, doing that. And I think that when he'd come out and visit and see what, you know, what we were building out there, he really kind of got into it. And so it, I think it started his, his future too, with where you are right now. And, and he actually took it a lot further than I did, you know, in the end, your mom and your dad and everything that they were doing with the sheep and everything. So, but, do you, but, but yes, I think he was, he was an influence on me. And I think my folks recently, Expected that because of that too. David was probably a lot more intellectual than I was. Um, you know, he had done very well in college. He actually had a doctorate degree. Of course, my folks really liked that. And I, so I think it opened the door a little bit for me to, to follow through, you know. Yeah. And you mentioned um, uh, an art teacher. Like, I'm very curious if they're, you know, like the creative path can be challenging. And especially if you have messages from general society, it's not a real job or you'll never make your, you know, all the things we hear. And so I feel like teachers and mentors or people that have inspired you or supported you along the way, maybe helped in the success of that. And if, if you had that experience, people that really you looked up to that helped you see like this is possible or I can do this, you know, that kind of thing. most definitely that's that that's what did it for me it was my uh mentors and teachers and people that influenced me fellow students um and it, as i say it's probably started in in high school with in mrs laramie's class and then it went from there in college i had some teachers that really helped me out that really saw some potential there i guess and then what really kind of did it a real change in my life was when I went to Yale Summer School of Music and Art, which was between my junior and senior year. And it was kind of a real special thing. I never thought I was actually going to get in. My my painting professor, and since I was a junior, at, said, you know, you should think about this. I always wanted to do this, but I never got in. But maybe you should apply for this thing. And so I applied for it. And it was a full scholarship to uh, eight weeks at this wonderful uh, old estate in, in upstate Connecticut. Um, that was run by uh, an endowment that was left by this woman for Yale University to promote art and music. And so I applied 
and I think there was several hundred applicants and they, they accepted 20 people from all over wow. the country. So um, I was very lucky and very shocked that I actually got in. And so I did that and it was an amazing opportunity to mingle with not just students from all over the country that were really unique and really good at what they were doing, but also the faculty were artists from New York that were brought up for the, to teach us. And uh, so I really got involved with the whole New York art scene through that. And at the time, conceptual art was really popular as so I find I was getting into that. But while I was there, I connected with one fellow student, Al Taylor, who was a major influence on my life because um, we just kind of really clicked in what we did. I really liked what he was doing, which was really strange stuff. And he really liked what I was doing, which was really strange stuff, but it was, it was different than what he was doing. And so after that summer, uh, Al ended up going to, down to New York City. He had, he, was, he had gone to Kansas City Art Institute, but he got a gig with the, uh, through the Whitney Museum program that for his senior year in New York. So he was in New York. He, had this, he got this little funky loft down, down on, 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 on Canal Street in, in Manhattan. And, and I'd go down and visit them, him while I was still going to my, finishing my senior year at Alfred. And, um, Anyways, I was really, it was amazing, you know, to see that he was doing this. We'd go to all the art galleries and he, and he introduced me to some people like, you know, he, he, he had done some work with Robert Rauschenberg and people like that. And, uh, and he was always so encouraging to me. And he always said, you got to get out of that place up in the country. You got to come to New York. You got to come to New York. And so I did. When I graduated, I went to New York and Al ended up getting another loft space. And so I took over his old loft space. So, uh, and I was at that point still painting. I majored in painting. And, but while I was at Alfred, my major kind of shifted because after I left Yale summer school, I kind of got into more conceptual stuff and not so much painting anymore. So my senior year was involved with doing very conceptual uh, pieces. But anyway, so I get to New York and, I, and I'm still thinking I'm gonna paint, but then I got this job working for this commercial photographer. And so that's how I started to learn photography. And I could relate to it in a way because it was an interesting technique. And, and after a period of many, many years, I actually developed something out of using all of those commercial photography skills and putting them into my artwork. Yeah. So I was able to combine all that stuff. So that's kind of where I am now, but it kind of took years to develop that. So, so they were all mentors. So, and also the, the photographer that I worked for in New York, which was a real mentor for me. And then when I moved to California, I worked for a photographer in San Francisco, who also was a big influence on me. So it was the photography influence, plus Al Taylor was an early stimulus. And then the support I had it from, from Alfred, and then of course Yale Summer School in general, all the faculty there, all the students there were a major influence on me. Yeah, is it, it's kind of fun to think about it, isn't it? Like step stones. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, mentors I've had, like, I feel like I could never repay them, you know? And mm -hmm. I realized one day that it, I wasn't supposed to repay them. I was supposed to turn and do it for the next ones coming, you know, that we all do right. it for the next ones coming. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that as because I knew that painting was where things were starting and then photography where you ended up and then you're in Mendocino mm -hmm. County. And I'm curious about, you know, it's really cool because some mediums don't lend themselves as easily to both commercial and the more conceptual side of yeah. things. Yeah. And so when did you have a way? So you've always done both and you had a studio in downtown and you had, mm -hmm. you know, jobs realizing mm -hmm. like some bread and butter could be f mm -hmm. doing photography for catalogs and wineries mm -hmm. and wine bottles. And luckily you also love wine. That's so handy. Yeah, and that uh, yeah, that helps. How did you balance your time between work stuff and conceptual stuff? Would you parse it out like I'm going to go on a trip and I'm only going to do my conceptual stuff while I'm on this, you know, because you've traveled different parts of the world. And then when yeah. you're at work, you're at work. How did you divide that out in your head and in your studio space? Well, that's that's a good question, because I it, there was periods of time when all I was doing was commercial work, you know, plus developing my homestead still. That was an ongoing thing. And I always kind of looked at that as the creative outlet at the time. Yeah. Um, and, and then the, the studio work and the, developing the business, 
I looked at developing the business as a very creative act as well. Yeah. But the work was work. But I was I was good at it. You know, I was really good at it and, and built a really good reputation for a commercial photographer. So I put uh, my fine artwork on the back burner for a long time. And as you good, as you brought this up about traveling, it seemed like the only time I was really picking up a camera for myself was when I was traveling. Right. And then I got really motivated to shoot stuff on yeah. a trip. You know, anything that was unique and different, I really got into it. Where back in, in, in my town, I just, I didn't document anything, wasn't really interested in anything for, for a long period of time. Uh, but then I got stimulated because I uh, did a couple of shows at the local museum and I had to get work together for right. them. You had an and, assignment. Right, exactly. And so then I got remotivated again. I always had a lot of artist friends in the community were always really, really close. And so I always kind of had that feeling. But in terms of my production, it, it started to evolve to, you know, having these shows again and starting to show. And, and and then that's when I found out I was kind of relating my commercial work into my creative work. But there were a lot of dry spells where and it, it, first it bothered me and then it didn't bother me that I wasn't being creative because I realized it'll happen when it happens and that's when it's going to be good, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that was connected to the next question, which is, you know, like in certain phases of our lives, when you're like building or having small kids or you're like creating your house and your homestead of gardening, it's a lot of work. And you had like, was it a one hour commute between yeah, home and, and everything? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's that can suck some time and energy away, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but of course, mm -hmm. I'm sure you had like very profound thoughts on your drive every single day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was when I did my thinking. Yeah, sure. right. It just makes me think about how hard it is sometimes a lot of time to create in the middle of the chaos, which is adult life, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that need to get done. And then there's also a need to relax our brain a little to let the creativity out instead of always right. feeling like duty. Right. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. On one hand, you were like, I don't know. I don't know if I feel good about this. On the other hand, you're like, that's fine. It's what's happening right now and kind of waiting for an inspiration. But also it is sort of a tip or a trick for folks to think about when you're talking about when you would travel, that would really come out. And in yeah. a way, the travel was a tool for that and to okay. put good energy and intention and money towards making it happen, you know? Yep. And sometimes like we create better in a different scenario than sitting at home. And then sometimes we need an assignment like your mm -hmm. art show and we're going to create mm -hmm. no matter what, even if somebody's knocking on the door every 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about either as a career or just for fun in life creating in the middle of things? Well, it surely, I guess, fulfills my internal needs. What else can I say about it? it, it uh, I'm glad I'm doing it. I'm glad that that's my profession. Uh, it does. It's, it's fulfilling <clears throat> when you when, when you get some good stuff coming along. It's, it's very fulfilling. And right now I'm kind of in that mode again because I'm, I'm, ha I'm having another show at the museum in the fall. It's a retrospective, basically, of 30 years of worth of work. And it's getting kind of exciting. It, since I'm pretty much retired right now, too, it's, it's total fulfillment in a way. Yeah. You know, the other thing, you know, being, being a single guy, I never had any kids. I guess I had more opportunities that, you know, than folks that really had to raise families in order to, to do that. Also, the financial aspect of it, I didn't have the pressures. So I could, maybe that helped me go on with my career and not feel the need to really be making a lot of money. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one thing that you mentioned the last time we talked was about, you know, in this whole being part of like the cycle of the people that supported and helped us and the way we pay back isn't to turn and help them, but to continue on the line. And you mentioned mentoring someone or some folks. And so how, how's that feeling and how's that going? It's really wonderful. It is. It's amazing. It's, 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 uh, again, a real fulfillment, maybe more than just being creative is to work with young people and see where they've gone. And I've had assistants all along the way. And there are a couple in particular that have, really been amazing and have done very well in their own career uh, based on photography and what, what I was doing. And they become really good friends. And I have somebody right now that I'm mentoring. It just started about a year or so ago and, and he does silkscreen yeah. work. He does uh, t-shirts and his 
as, at this point, his folks' garage, but he's got a whole silk screen set up with the wheel that has all the things and all the various colors and all that stuff. And he's really into it. And I'm really helping him, encouraging him in that direction. And and then he's helping me. You know, the wonderful thing about mentoring somebody at the give back, it's amazing. You learn as much from them as they're learning from you. Yeah, and definitely. And it's, it's just, it's really wonderful. You know, and he's a skateboarder. And, and you know, so you're learning about what skateboarding is all about, you know, and the vernacular of skateboarding, yeah. you know, which is the, the whole, whole thing in itself. So there's that and uh, met a lot of young people through him and through other connections. And I feel blessed to be able to give to uh, people, you know, yeah. those skills and experiences and just kind of, you know, understanding and uh, that you just set an example, I guess, so that they feel comfortable in doing it too. Yeah, definitely. We also talked about, you know, like marketing can be creative, creating your own business can be creative and all of that. And those are all like accumulation of small steps for those things to even, you know, exist and stick with it. What do you think? So one side of it is is so interesting to think about because no matter what job anyone has, we can be creative. We're like, could be creating something from nothing, or we could be looking at it from a different angle. Same with accounting. We could look at that from a different Mm -hmm. angle, put money in a different place and ta-da, something could happen, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that creativity, even in business and being self-employed and how you kept going even when it was hard or even when it was frustrating to have to do your books instead of do your, you know, there's, Mm -hmm. there's all the practical side to being a professional maker also. Yeah. How did it feel being your own boss and that kind of, how did you organize your time? And uh, Well, I felt really satisfied and it took a while to actually have that realization, I guess, uh, because it is, it's a big job. And as you say, it's a very creative act too. Just creating a business is, the association with people is so wonderful. You know, that's what business is all about is association with people. Right. And and, and that's that's been really, really great too. And I, I had, I remember I had a realization one day. I was sitting in the studio. Uh, I had just was able to purchase this building and put my studio in it, and and it was set up just the way I wanted it. And it was really a busy time for me. I had a lot of catalog accounts, and it was amazing what was happening in this little town. And and I, and I was shooting a job right then, and I had my assistant there, and then I had a stylist there that was helping out, and and so it was like nice being able to give them work. And, and the phone rang and I went over to the phone, sat at my desk and picked up the phone and it was a big job that was coming in. Then all right then the, the door opened and the UPS guy came in with a bunch of boxes of stuff that he that I needed to photograph for another client. And so I'm looking around in the room and the client <laughs> that I was working for that day is standing there too and she's so happy what's going on that day of shooting. And so she's there and I'm watching my assistant and the stylist and my client, or my client really happy doing what we're doing right there. I'm getting this call on the phone and this guy comes in with more work. And I just thought, I'm going to sat, I'm going to just look at this moment for a second. I just sat there and smiled. That's I awesome. Said, yeah. You know, look at creative. It was great. It yeah. was really great. Yeah. That is really awesome. Yeah. And see, that's exactly why I'm so curious to story trade with people and hear about these stories because um, I think people second guess sometimes the confidence of choosing a creative endeavor or being self-employed or going through all the details you have to go through. And But it seems when you talk to people who've done it for 30 and 40 years that really stuck with it and hung on for the ride, that their gut was kind of in alignment with where they were wanting to go and like abundance happened. And that's exactly what happened yeah. to you in that moment because yeah. you were like willing to give it a go <laughs> and stick yeah. with it. Yeah, it's re- it's very satisfying. And, you know, yeah. uh, it was about a month or so ago. I have a friend that he, he's he made a career here as a silk screen uh, person and he, and he did very well and built a big business. And it was kind of neat because I put them together with my the person I'm working with now, this young kid. I bought a pizza one day and we're sitting in the backyard eating pizza. And so this guy's telling the kids stories about how he got into business and all of the, you know, the shortfalls and what happened. And the kid was just overwhelmed with it, which is great. It was just really great. You know? Yeah. 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 It like, it's his own form of encouragement. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. It's the shortfalls and, and, and figuring out how to make us make it work. And, and then getting the support from the people that, your clients, you know, that support comeback is so wonderful too. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I feel like maybe even especially during these pandemic times, people might be at home thinking, well, I always did want to learn guitar or I always did want to <laughs> play the fiddle. I, f I feel like there's a lot to be said for instead of thinking, oh, well, I can't or I don't know where to start or whatever is just to go find someone doing it and ask for their help or pay a teacher or whatever. And then I was just thinking about mental health and creativity and then we're in technological times, but then humans love having their hands in things. We love making and doing things just every human does in, in whatever form calls them. Do you have any thoughts about like all of those ideas in this last year? And that's a vague question, but. Well, yeah, it's an interesting thing because uh, when the pandemic started and I was pretty much stuck in the house quite a bit, I got very productive and creative at that point. And I was doing a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I started a whole new idea and plan on, on photographing some stuff that, that ended up going to be in the show. Uh, also going through a lot of old images. I started just sorting through stuff and throwing away some things and, and spent a lot of time just doing that. And so in a way, the pandemic has been an influence and a good positive environment for me to to be, to be satisfied with what I was producing and creating and getting me motivated to create. Yeah. And like reflection time and right, right. Yeah. All, all of that. Yep. All of that. Yeah. Is there anything else that comes to your mind that you'd like to say about like how sometimes we only have those small moments to create and make and is it worth doing and about creativity in general and sticking with it no matter what? Well, you know, the, for me, what's been really neat, too, is being kind of, you know, recognized as a photographer here in town, uh, actually being able to give back to the community in a lot of ways from my skills. So I, I, I'm on a lot of committees and, and boards and things like that and on the museum board for years and all that kind of stuff and really help the community in general because it's part of your support system when you small, live in a small town. And then, you know, when you have things like auctions, you can always donate pieces to auctions and it usually brings really good money because you've got a reputation and, you know, and so that aspect of it is kind of cool too. And I've always, I've really gotten into that part of it as well. Yeah. So like as it, a profession, you, you, you're giving back to a community. Right. Yep. Making the full circle. Yeah. <laughs> right. Where can people learn more about your artwork if they wanted to go look? Well, I have a website tomlyden.com it's i call it my retro website it was produced probably 20 <laughs> years ago and i have never changed it i've added images to it but the formatting is this old classic early website thing and i kind of love it in a way so they can go there and see stuff they can see you know some of my commercial stuff and some my fine art stuff and uh a feeling of what I'm what I'm all about and where I where I live too and, and there's some travel stuff in there too and when uh, and if has, anyone's passing through your area when is this show coming out in the museum it's going to be in September at the Grace Hudson Museum in Ukiah California it starts I don't know if the date's quite set yet and we all we definitely hope the museum will be open then right now right. it's still not but there's a show coming in in the spring it's a traveling show that the director spent a bunch of money getting here and that's going to be up in the spring and hopefully people are going to be able to check that out and so my show along with two other artists actually there's the three of us that first had a show 30 years ago and it's so we're all doing this retrospective of our 30 year anniversary from the show and the interesting thing is one of those folks the painter has actually died he died of swine flu back during that pandemic yeah um and so it's a kind of a tribute to him too so it's a photographer and a painter and a sculptor. My work has gotten to the point where there's actually some, paint, some painting involved with it now. It's not oh, just photography. Cool. There, there, it's it's a generational thing where I would do a, a, like an abstract painting and then I'm photographing that with stuff on top of it. And so you're it's a it's a it's a photograph, but the base for first generation was a painting. Of it. Wow. So, well, I hope yeah. I get to see it in some way, even if it's virtual. <laughs> well, I will. Yeah, I'll send you. Yeah, the yeah. Well, I hope it won't be virtual. I'll, I'll send you an announcement when it comes that would together. Be awesome. And, and 
Well, I so appreciate um, you spending this time with me so much. And thanks for being my uncle and for the influences you knew you did and didn't have on my creative yeah. life. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it a lot. And yeah. um, thank you so much. Yeah, well, we'll it's been wonderful seeing you uh, progress, too, with what you're doing, you're, with the incredible stuff that you're doing now. It's just it's just wonderful. It's wonderful. Maybe painting runs in the family. <laughs> yeah, I, it may be. You know, it, it's funny, real, real quick aside here music there's so much part of you that came through your dad and my folks were not interested in music at all yeah. they never had music in the house and so you wonder where did that come from you right. know and they had not really art my dad you know was a creative guy kind of a craftsman oriented guy a little bit but no music there was never music wow that is really interesting Just, yeah wow yeah he was probably thinking of like woodworking projects in his head instead. Something like that, yeah. But it, it definitely no. I mean, there was not. There wasn't even a. We, we got a, like a record player back then for for us, you know. But they didn't even. They never even turned it on. There was never any any music wow. other than my mother waking up in the morning and she'd be singing something. The radio would be on in the kitchen along with the news and the popular music of the day, and she might she might be singing a little bit to it, you know. That that was the extent of it. <laughs> I love that you remember just that little blip. I can just see it. I can see her. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, making breakfast, get kids off to school and, you know, maybe singing a little bit. Not a lot, you know. Yeah, yeah. And she'd stop when people came into the room, of course. Right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. I look forward to sharing this with folks, too. Great, great, Yay. great. If you would like to be in touch or have someone you would love to hear interviewed, email me at afainhouse at gmail.com. I also hope that you're inspired to subscribe to this podcast. New episodes come out every Tuesday. If you would like to watch these interviews in video form and are curious about the happenings of my little business called Fain House, where I paint and make art prints and gift cards for my watercolor originals, I'd love for you to sign up for my email list. When you do, you'll get a coupon for 10% off a one-time purchase in my Etsy shop and first dibs on my annual limited edition calendar printing. You'll also be granted access to our free private Facebook group, which is the one spot you can watch these interviews. If that all sounds fun to you, go to your web browser and type bit.ly backslash Fainhouse to sign up. That's with a capital F and a capital H in Fainhouse. This is not a weekly newsletter, but rather a list of folks who are interested in hearing from me time to time. I'm Annie Fane Barillon. Thanks so much for listening. And I'll leave you with a quote for the day. No matter what your age or your life path, whether making art is your career or your hobby or your dream, it is not too late or too egotistical or too selfish or too silly to work on your creativity. Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way.